So let's just pray real quick. Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for a chance to dive into your word. And Father, we just say that speak to us today through your word that we just want to see you more clearly, that we would you would take us deeper, that we would experience you in a new and very real way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So here we go. We're in Job chapter 38. And so we've heard from Job's friends. We've heard from Job and then we've heard from his friends, and then we've heard from Job, but finally we get to hear from God. So I think this is the part of the book of Job, yeah, where it actually starts to get good is when we hear from God. And so uh, 38, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job from a whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such great ignorant words? I really like the, um, the New King James Version. It says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So could you imagine giving Job uh, counsel and then hearing God say this? Because God's speaking to him through the whirlwind, so you would assume his friends can hear this too. You've been counseling Job, and then all of a sudden God says, who is this that uh, darkens uh, the counsel with words without wisdom or knowledge? Like, who, like it's kind of that, like, ugh, like you kind of like cringe moment. Like, that's me that's been talking. And so... Uh, God is speaking to Job, and, and he says, and basically this is the statement that sums up the entire book of Job for me. It is, counsel without godly wisdom, even though it is meant to help, only darkens the situation. So I'm going to say that again. Counsel without godly wisdom, even though it was meant to help, only darkens the situation. And I think that's been it, because we saw that Job's friends gave they gave good counsel. I know like other preachers like bash on all Job's friends. I disagree. If you take what they say and apply it to your life, it's really good counsel, but it was it was counsel without godly wisdom. They didn't know that God that Job was innocent. They didn't know what was going on and they're trying to make sense of Job's situation and all it did was make things worse. And so, in verse 3, God says, "Brace yourself like a man Love it. Because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. So now God's going to ask Job questions, but he's like, man up, Job. You ready? Because you're going to answer me now. And so uh, the questions that he's going to ask are, can you create like God has? And can you oversee and govern creation like God does? And so God says, if you answer these questions, then you can question me. And so... Job's friends have constantly declared God's greatness. If you remember all the old chap uh, other chapters, they constantly like glorify God, glorify God. But Job doesn't truly like see um, the greatness of God until he's being spoken to by God. And so the word here says, "The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind." And the word "Lord" is uh, the Hebrew word Yehovah, which means existing one. It's the proper name for God. And what's interesting is is that for the Ancient Hebrews, this word was too sacred to even say. You wouldn't, they, they wouldn't even say this word. It, 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 like, I, I'm not worthy to say the proper name of God. And this is who is speaking to Job. And he's going to reveal this about himself. So verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much, who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? And what supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone? And as the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. So point number one tonight is this, that God laid the foundations of the earth. God determined its measurements like someone building a building. And says all of heaven rejoiced. And God says, where were you when I did this? And, and who is it who determines its measurements? Like, Job, can you determine the measurements? If you think about it, if the earth was like... I don't even know what the, it's a really small measurement, but if the earth was uh, a couple miles, like whatever miles closer to the sun, we'd all die. And if it was that same amount away from the sun, we'd all freeze to death. And if the moon was any closer, it would crash into the earth. And if it was any further away, it'd leave the earth's orbit. Like God literally, like in order to, to sustain life on earth, his measurements were precise. And God's like, can you do this? And Job's like, uh, No. And so verse 8, who kept the sea inside the boundaries as it burst forth from the womb, as I uh, clothed it with the clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked it behind 
uh, barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this is as far, this far and no farther where you come. Here your proud waves must stop. So number two, God made the sea and placed boundaries around it. And we saw this in earlier chapters. If you think about it, this is God's greatness. He literally says, hey, I'm going to create oceans but they're not going to go any further. And so you'll even see this like a, in a tsunami or whatever. The waves will come into land. And after they, they've come beyond what they should become, what happens to them? They go right back to their boundaries of where the, that's as far as you go. You need to stay there. And God says, I'm the one who did that. I'm the one that decides that. Have you ever, in verse 12, have you ever commanded the morning to appear and cause the dawn to rise in the east? So number three, God commanded the sun to rise and set all the days into motion. Think about it this way. God created the concept of time. You guys ever thought about that? Like somebody asked me the other day, like, well, what about, like, who created God? And I'm like, I don't think you understand. God created time itself. He's outside the concept of time, so you can't even fathom what God is even like. And so, he says, I did this. What did you do, Job? Well, I slept in this morning, you know, <laughs> like, what did you do? Verse 13, have you made the daylight spread to the ends of the earth and bring it to an end and the night's, uh, the, and bring it an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath the seal it is robed in brilliant colors. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? So now God's talking about two different things here. He's talking about the difference between light and dark. So number four, only God knows the depths of spiritual darkness and the heights of spiritual goodness. We, we kind of saw this in the book of Revelation, but we can't even fathom what it will be like when we stand before God. And, Job, and he says to Job, do you even have any clue how dark it gets and how amazing my presence is? And God's like, and Job's like, no, <laughs> I don't. Number five, only God knows every detail of the depth of the sea. What's interesting about this is less than 5% of the ocean's floor has been explored. Isn't that crazy? Like, think about it. I often wonder because there were civilizations, and if you do the math, I personally believe that the Earth's population was similar to what it is right now before the flood. There was whole civilizations that are now underwater. And uh, I was watching this show, and, and uh, this guy is like, uh, this is amazing. It's like uh, uh, nature doesn't do 90-degree angles. And he's like, under this water, there's all of these, like, squares that almost are like foundations of buildings, and they won't go explore it because the only explanation would be a flood, global flood. So they're like, no, you're, you're crazy. And he's like, show me anywhere else on, on, on the planet where nature does a 90-degree corner. And so it's just kind of cool. Like, you have to ask yourself, if only 5% of the ocean is explored, and he says, Job, do you even know what's down there? Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> this is after the flood. It's like, you don't even know what was before the flood. If there were giants and everything else, I mean, you have no clue what's down there. Do you, do, do you know? I, I know every inch of the, the, oh, the ocean floor. Job, do you know that? He's like, no. Verse 17, do you know the gates of death? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it if you know. Where does light come from? Where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But of course, you know all of this. For you were born before it was all created, and you are so very experienced. God is literally like sarcasm here. Like, I didn't, I, I, like, I don't think I've ever seen God be sarcastic and, like, this is it right here. It's like, oh, of course you know, right, Job? You know this. And he's like, I have no clue what you're talking about. In fact, in um, the New King James, it says, 
Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the, the uh, breadth of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. So God, again, God is showing his greatness, but he's comparing his greatness to both physical and spiritual world. Like we, we might say, well, we're pretty smart. There's people that know a lot. There's science people that know a lot. But when it comes to the spiritual world, nobody knows a whole lot of anything. We have no clue how, how deep the spiritual world goes. And so number six, God created the boundaries for light and darkness. Again, not just the physical day and light, but the boundaries for spiritual darkness and the boundaries for spiritual light. This is the boundaries in which we will operate within. Number seven, only God knows the depths of hell. It says, have, you, have, you, have the gates of hell? death been revealed to you so we know jesus conquered death and hades right we know this okay in revelation 118 it says i am he who lives i was dead and behold i'm alive forevermore amen i have the keys of hades and death so jesus has seen this door so what god is questioning job have you seen this jesus has jesus has been there but not only that he holds the keys to the location that God is saying, have you seen this? And so the second place is the abyss or the bottomless pit. Now, I want to quickly explain to you guys real quick. There are three places um, that are misunderstood as one place in Scripture. The first is hell. The second is the lake of fire. You have to understand hell and the lake of fire are not the same thing. Okay, this will be the lake of fire will be the eternal judgment for Satan as well as those who went to hell. So everybody's like, oh, well, I had a guy one time be like, well, I want to go to the hell because all the, the good musicians are there. Yeah, but you won't be there for long because your your final destination is the lake of fire. And so and we know that this will take place after the millennial reign. But the third place that everyone always kind of miss misunderstands the three and they, they lump it as one is the abyss or the bottomless pit and so what's interesting is the uh, the bottomless pit in, is the greek word abyssos meaning bottomless and the word abyssos is only found in one other scripture outside the book of revelation and it's when jesus meets a man with demons so let's look at that real quick in luke eight thirty, jesus demanded what is your name Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. Then the demons kept begging Jesus not to send them to the bottomless pit. It's the only other place you'll find is outside of the book of Revelation. So the, the, the abyssos is where Satan will be held for a thousand years during the millennial reign. The only other place in Scripture that the word abyssos is is when the, these demons beg Jesus not to send them there. So you can imagine this guy, this demon-possessed guy, the demons know who Jesus is, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up, and they're like, oh, shoot. Did we, like, did we, like, overstep our bounds? Are we in trouble? Because he shouldn't be, like, oh, why did he come see us? And they're like, Jesus, don't send us to the bottomless pit. Don't do it. We'll just anything, we'll leave. Just don't, like, if we've messed up. And they're in straight panic mode because they think that Jesus is going to send them there. So the abyss is a holding place for demons who are too evil for this world. That's what that place is. So if that's not hell, and that's also not the lake of fire. And, and God is asking Job, do you even have any clue how deep the darkness goes? And Job's like, I, even talking about it right now, we don't even have any clue. And so... The legion of demons were afraid that they had crossed the line, and Jesus had the power to lock them away. In Revelation 20, we see that Satan will be held there in the abyss for a thousand years during the millennial reign. Okay, So the abyss was created by God, but it's not for us. So people will never see the abyss. You guys aren't going to see the abyss. Hopefully you won't see hell either, but you, you, people will never see the abyss. Okay. Um, and so God's asking Job, do you know the depths of darkness? 
Do you, do you even know how to get there? Do you, do you know where the abyss is? Do you know where the lake of fire is? Do you even know where hell is? Do you even know how to get to any of these places? And Job's like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Verse 22, have you visited the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? I have reserved them for, as weapons for time of trouble for the day of the battle and war. Number eight, only God knows the wrath that's been stored up for the great tribulation. It's amazing. So I, I remember how we've been talking about how um, uh, Melchizedek, and how I'm pretty confident that even back in Job's time, they were prophesying about a Messiah as well as end times. And so right here, he's like, do you even know what I've stored up for tribulation? See, we can study Revelation. We did. Who went through the Revelation study with me? Okay. We went through the Revelation study, but we still have no concept of what that will be like. And God's like, do you even know what I have stored up? And Job's like, No. Do you know the final plan? Do you wield the power to bring wrath on the earth, Job? And he's like, no. So hail is frequently used as a tool of judgment against God's enemies. So real quick, we see hail is used against Egypt uh, in Exodus 9. Hail is used against the Canaanites in Joshua 10. Hail is used against Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38. And hail is used in the Great Tribulation in Revelation 16. All right, back to Job, verse 24. Where is the path to the source of light? Where's the home of the east wind? Who created a channel of the torrents of rain? Who laid out the path for the lightning? Who makes the rain fall on barren land in the desert where no one lives? Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground and makes the tender grass spring up? Does the rain have a father? Who gives birth to the dew? Who is the mother... <laughs> Mountain Dew? No, wrong one. Who is the mother of the ice? Who gives birth to the frost and from the heavens? From the water, for from the water turns to ice as hard as rock, and the surface of the water freezes. So number nine, God has control over the weather. Can can man come close to God's greatness? You know, we we like to think we're awesome, but are we really? All right, verse 31, can you direct the, the movement of the stars uh, binding the cluster of the Pallades or loosening the cords of Orion? Can you direct the constellations through the seasons or guide the bear with her cubs across the heavens? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? So this uh, Pallades, if I'm saying that right, is a cluster of stars known as the Seven Sisters. It's the most obvious cluster of stars. Um, visible with the naked eye and so this is what what god's talking about and so number 10 god set the stars in the sky and made the constellations and god challenges job because obviously job has no power over space and stars and any of that and so verse 34 <clears throat> can you shout to the clouds and make it rain can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct who gives uh intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind, who is wise enough to count all the clouds, who can tilt the, the water jars of heaven when the parched ground is dry and the soil is hardened into clods? Can you, uh, can you stalk prey for a lioness and satisfy the young lion's appetite as they lie in their dens or crouch in the thicket? Who provides food for the ravens when their young cry out to God and wonder about hunger? So number 11, God's not only in control of the weather, but he's in control of the earth's entire ecosystem. So ecosystem is your blank. He's in charge of the ecosystem. Who eats what and where it will rain and what will grow? And he says, Job, can you do this? Uh, do, do you have the ability to, to determine who's going to eat what? And so God has challenged Job. And it's, what's interesting is if you back up, and look at it from like a uh, zoomed out view, is that God has challenged Job, the creation of the universe, the expanse of space, the depths of the spirit world, now the weather patterns, and now he's going to go even simpler still. So God started with huge, and he keeps getting more and more simple, 
and Job still has no answer. And he's and as we're gonna see here, he gets really simple, and Job has no answer. So let's see how God breaks it down. Verse one of chapter thirty-nine. Do you know when the wild goats give birth? Have you watched as the deer are born in the wild? Do you know how many months they carry their young? Are you aware of the time of their delivery? They crouch down and give birth to their young and deliver their offspring. Their young grow up in open fields and leave their home and never return. Who gives the wild donkey its freedom? Who united it? it uh, who untied its ropes? I have placed it in the wilderness. Its home is a wasteland. It hates the noise of the city and has no driver to shout at it. The mountains are its pasture land where it searches for every blade of grass. And so God says, do you know the timing of the birth of wild animals? Do you have knowledge of the wild donkey and how it even manages to survive? Job's like, crap, I don't even know this one. (laughs) Pass, lifeline, I don't know. Give 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 me an easier question. See, wild donkey is often spoken of over people who were wild, untamed, who rejected rules and structure, structure, yet could survive in harsh conditions. Ishmael's descendants are, ex- are described as wild donkeys by the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus. Okay, So he says, hey, you guys aren't going to follow the rules. You're untamed. You're unruly. But somehow you will manage to survive in the desert. And God says, do you even know how that happens? And he's like, no. And so he breaks it down even more simple. Oh, number 12, God knew the wild donkey would live, uh, how the wild donkey would live and what it would need to survive. God knew that. So he breaks it down again. Verse 9, will the wild ox consent to being tamed? Will it spend the night in your stall? Can you hitch a wild ox to a plow? Will it plow a field for you? Given its strength, can you trust it? Can you leave and trust the ox to do your work? Can you rely on it to bring home your grain and deliver it to your threshing floor? So God asked the question, will the wild ox serve you, and do you know how to teach it? And so no doubt the wild ox would serve Job, but it's believed that Job had no clue how to train animals. Like, his servants did, he didn't. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, I work for Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick has no clue how to edit video. I just do it for him, okay? So, so if God said, hey, Pastor Rick, do you know how to edit video? He'd be like, no. And so God has literally broken it down even more simple. Hey, do you even know how to train an ox? Oh, that's right. You can't even do that. And he's like, okay. And so God knew what animals would be useful to help man. Number 13. So then he breaks it down even more. Verse 13, the ostrich flaps her wings gladly, but there is no match for the feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on top of the earth, letting them warmed, be warmed in the dust. She doesn't worry about what, uh, that a foot might crush them or a wild animal might destroy them. She is harsh towards her young as if they were not her own. She doesn't care if they, di- if they die, for God has deprived her of wisdom. Well, that's probably true. Have you ever seen how small an ostrich's head is? Never mind. Okay. He has given her no understanding, and whenever she jumps up to run, she passes the swift horse with its rider. See, God speaks proudly uh, uh, of the proud waving wings of the flightless bird. Does anyone ever else wonder, like, what's the point of an ostrich? Anyone? Like, first of all, they're hideous. Second of all, they're super mean. And who can eat that much egg? I mean, come on. They're, like, massive. And so God asked Job, why does the ostrich have wings if it doesn't fly? (laughs) Uh, I don't know. You made it. Like, why are you asking me this question? See, God made animals that are wild and animals that are useful to a man. And here we see that God, it makes animals that make no sense to us at all. I I was, uh, somebody was um, looking over my, my, my work to edit some of it. And they were like, have you ever seen a platypus? That thing definitely makes no sense at all. Or even a house cat. No, don't go there. Okay. We won't go there. We won't go there. 
Okay, it's how demons get in your home. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> or am I? All right. I'm telling you, when they hiss at you, it goes, Isaac. No? Nobody else? Just me. Okay, just me. All right. But God made animals that make no sense. None at all. And there's a quote uh, from Enduring Word. It says, get used to God's absurd absurdity and live by faith, not by sight. Be like the ostrich, though you cannot fly. You can still flap your wings joyfully. That is awesome. I love that. You can't fly, but still flap your wings joyfully. See, we're talking about the greatness of God. And some of us here, you're like, I, I, you're in a place in your life where you wish things were different. Maybe life isn't going how you wanted it to go. Maybe you're like Job. Maybe, maybe you had a low, in, 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 a low valley in your life. And God says, hey, he, your wings might not allow you to fly, but will you still praise him joyfully? Do you know how great he is? He is worthy of your praise. And so tonight we're going we're gonna to do some praise and worship here in a moment. And so, number 14, God made animals that serve no purpose but to give him pleasure. No purpose at all. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. See, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It has to be from God. See, a lot of times everything has to make sense to us. Well, why would God do this? Well, we live in a fallen world. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not your plan. Maybe your plan's stupid. Did you ever think about that? Maybe it is, because is it God's plan? If it's not God's plan, I'm going to tell you right now, your plan is stupid. My son's not here, otherwise he'd be like, Dad, we don't say stupid. <laughs> no, no, that plan is, trust me, son, it's stupid. If it's not God's plan, that's what it is. And so, verse 19, it says, Have you given the horse its strength and clothed its neck with a flowing mane? Did you give it the ability to leap like locusts, its majestic snorting is terrifying. Its path, <clears throat> its paws, it paws the earth and, re and rejoices in its strength when it charges into battle. It laughs at fear and is unafraid. It does not run from the sword. The arrow rattles against it. The spear and the javelin flash. It paws the ground fiercely and rushes towards, uh, forward into battle. And when the ram's horn blows, it snorts at the sound of the horn. It senses the battle in distance. It quivers the captain's command and the noise of battle. I love it. If you, if you go back to the, the lineage uh, in Genesis, one of the names means snorting. And it's the word used for war horse. And my, my wife, she does cowboy mountain shooting and her horse does this. Like it gets all amped up to go in the arena and so she can shoot guns off this horse. And the horse is like, <sighs> like, like, it's like, yeah, let's do this. And like, she's like, calm down, calm down. Whoa, here we go. Like, literally, this, this thing just wants to go. That's why I don't ride horses, because I look like the monkey that's tied to the dog at the circus. Like, just like, all over the place. No fear at all. And so, number 15, God made animals who are fearless. And after describing the differences of land animals, God now looks at the birds of the air. And 26, is it your wisdom that makes the hawk soar and spread its wings towards the south? Is it at your command that the eagle rises to the heights and makes its nest? It lives on the cliffs, making its home on a distant rocky crag. From there it hunts its prey, keeping watch with piercing eyes. Its young gulp up down blood where there is where there's a carcass, there you'll find it. So Job is equally powerless to explain the ways of the hawk and eagle. I mean, he can't understand how a horse is fearless when you, he would be terrified to go into battle. And in Proverbs 3, 5, and I'm going to end with this. So if the, if the people come in to do worship, if you want to go ahead and come up, you can. But Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You know, we have to be fully aware that 
God in all of his greatness, in all of his greatness, that he has a better plan. That he is, that maybe your plan is stupid. And say, okay, God, you are so great. You are so amazing. What do you, what do you have for me? And so in Job 40, verse 1, and we're going to end here. Then the Lord, the Lord God said to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but you have no answers. Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How can I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. So Job finally gets his, um, his audience with God. He finally gets that. He's been saying, Wait, where's God? If I could stand before God, and then finally he gets that audience with God, and he has nothing, nothing to say. And so, Neji's going to get the guitar real quick. But I want to challenge you guys, not next week, we have to huddle next week, but the following week, we're going to talk about dinosaurs. Anyone ever had a, wondered about dinosaurs? Yeah, okay. We're going to talk about dinosaurs next week, because that's what the book of Job talks about. So, um, not next week, the following week. So don't miss that. If you've ever had questions on dinosaurs, the Bible talks about them. So no need to have questions about that anymore. But at this time, I just we're gonna um, we're gonna do some worship. In uh, and so if you guys will stand with me tonight. All right, so we're just going to do a time of worship for a moment. So I just want you guys to spread out. And uh, I want you to, if you're in that place where maybe things aren't going according to plan, I always challenge you guys to elevate Jesus. See, when we praise God, we elevate him. And when we don't praise Jesus, we elevate our situation. And so just, we, I just want to take a moment before we go to... Uh, we break and go to small groups, and um, and I just want to praise Jesus tonight.